From 8 News Now, this is Politics Now with Steve Sebelius and Patrick Walker. Well, what was expected to be a late night at the state capitol last night wrapped up hours ahead of a key deadline. Thanks for joining us. I'm Patrick Walker. Steve is off this week, but he taped some stuff that you will be seeing throughout the show. Around 1,000 new bills had until midnight last night to be passed out of the committees in which they were introduced. The dust now settling, and we're getting an idea of the about 280 nearly measures that did not make it. Lawmakers wasted no time throughout the day jumping from hearing room to hearing room, trying to pass as many bills out of the different committees as possible. Legislators introduced hundreds of bills in the past couple of weeks, leaving 1,000 up for consideration. But long days this week allowed for a much earlier than expected finish on the first House committee deadline day. We started at 8 in the morning and we didn't get finished about 8 or 9 o'clock at night. It's been very, very productive. Democrat Assemblyman Ozzy Fumo, his party in control in Carson City, didn't escape unscathed. His bill that would abolish the death penalty, a priority among some in his party, did not advance. I'm disappointed. We had it, uh, I was here last session and we had a hearing on it. Uh, I thought it was a great conversation that went back and forth with, with both pros and cons. And I think the more that we discuss it, the more people get, can get educated on it. A perennial bill that ruffles a lot of feathers every session failed again to make the cut on the Senate side. Senator Ivana Kensel chairs the Growth and Infrastructure Committee, which did not advance a bill that would allow photo radar and red light cameras on Nevada roads. It was clear after that hearing that there was not support from the committee or from stakeholders to move that bill forward, so um, it will not be making it, although I'm sure that it will continue to be a discussion that we have for many sessions. Republicans in the minority in the legislature did see some success moving bills through this week, but Assembly Minority Leader Jim Wheeler expressed disappointment his bill, which would have removed the requirement to have a concealed carry permit to carry a concealed firearm did not make it. Well, to me, that's part of our Constitution. I don't see why anyone should have to have a permit to uh, perform a right that's guaranteed in the Constitution. After both caucuses take stock this weekend of exactly what did and did not pass, the number of dead bills will likely reach triple digits. Well, some of these measures could come back as amendments to bills that did make it through. Around 80 bills were exempt from the deadline because they have to do with funding. That happens because the final budget bills, of course, don't come together until the last few days of the legislative session. That's at the beginning of June. All right, so let's talk about some of the other bills that lived this time, and they will be moving on this week. SB 450 makes it more difficult to do a recall election. This comes on the heels of several failed recall attempts of Democrat state senators by Republicans last year. SB SB 287 adds some bite to Nevada's public records law. It would add a fine for government agencies that are not complying with the public records law. It will see some changes before it comes up for a vote, however, over in the Senate. Assembly Joint Resolution 9 would end judicial elections. Judges instead would be picked by a 17-member committee. It would apply to all district court, court of appeals, and Supreme Court judges. And AB 376 would have police agencies document how many people they turn over to federal immigration authorities. It would also keep track of what crimes they were initially arrested for. Well, there is another group of bills that died, but probably you know, they didn't have much of a chance of passing in the first place. That includes a bill that would have banned prostitution in Nevada. SB 413 was initially co-sponsored by Republican Joe Hardy and Democrat Pat Spearman. However, Spearman withdrew her support last week. AB 470 would have raised the smoking age to 21 years old. That one didn't even get a hearing. A bill by Republicans that would have funded education savings accounts to the tune of $58 million also did not get a hearing. That was AB 218. And finally, the so-called textilizer bill died as well. AB 200 would have used a device at a car crash scene that would tell police if someone was using their phone. That one did get a hearing and drew a lot of strong opinions both for and against it. And a bill that would put cameras in some special education classrooms moved forward earlier this week. This is one that we have been closely tracking. SB 109 passed out of the Senate Education Committee. It's aimed at an issue Channel 8's I-Team has covered extensively. Autistic nonverbal students who can't tell an adult when they are mistreated in a classroom. The bill would put cameras in classrooms where over half of the students are nonverbal. Next, lawmakers will have to work out how to pay for that bill. CCSD estimates it would cost $25 million over the next two years. And so far, that would be an unfunded mandate. 
Well, for the last few weeks, I have been covering the issue of whether teachers will be getting the 3% raise promised by Governor Steve Sisolak. Sisolak told me last week that the money is there, even the school district, uh, even though rather the school district did not put it in their preliminary budget. So 8 News Now anchor Brian Loftus interviewed Dr. Uh, Jesus Jar, the Clark County School District Superintendent this week, to ask him about the governor's comments. What I said to the board and, and where we presented our, our tentative budget, it is a tentative budget. When we looked at the revenue coming in, you know, when you look at our payroll, uh, it's very simple. You know, it's a $2 billion payroll, so a 3% and a 2% roll up is $100 million, right? We're getting in the revenue projections that we're seeing coming in this session is $55 million. So there's a gap coming in. Um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at with that internal revenue coming, the revenue coming in, the 55 million, is giving us enough money to really cover our increased costs. Our, our two new schools that we're getting, we're looking at an increase in PERS. We're looking at some of these um, other issues that we're seeing um, that we've made cuts in the past to now increase. So the 55 million is getting us to a, where we are today as a whole without the raises. So those are some of the conversations. I've had conversations with leadership in Carson City around it. My CFO has talked to, their, to the state, um, C, um, Governor Sisolak's sure. CFO as well. So we're looking at see where the, where the numbers are, um, but I think we'll get there. So am I gonna get a raise or not? Is it a matter of you will, but maybe not next academic year? How do we answer that yeah. man or woman that's teaching in CCSD? Well, we're committed to make sure that our teachers, our educators are compensated and, and we see that coming through. So, you know, at this point, um, you know, we're looking and, and looking at somewhere else where we can bring in revenue uh, in locally, uh, not locally, uh, within, within our, um, the current budget that we sure. have and categoricals and different things that we can look at, see possibly that we can increase some of the things that we need to do to, so we can compensate all our employees. Well, there have been a lot of developments in the area of raises, including the union threatening a strike if they don't get them. You can see all of my stories on LasVegasNow.com. Well, a bill to raise the minimum wage made its uh, way through the first hurdle with just a few tweaks. Assembly Bill 456 would incrementally raise the minimum wage to $12 an hour for workers whose companies do not offer health insurance and $11 for those whose companies do by 2024. It was not voted out of a committee, but it was given a waiver from those deadlines. On Wednesday, supporters and opponents weighed in for nearly three hours on this bill. I'm proud to pay my employees 11 or more along with an insurance and a 401k. And I hope to pay my employees 15 or more as my company grows. And I believe if my small business can do this for my employees, I believe that the state can enforce this too. By raising the minimum wage by nearly 50% over the next several years, AB 456 will deny job opportunities to those most in need of gaining work experience. AB 456 is expected to pass through the legislature, and Governor Steve Sisolak has signaled his support for the passage of some form of a $12 an hour bill. Well, pushing for transparency. It begs the question, what are they trying to hide? And that's really alarming. The new excuse dispensary owners say the state is using for not turning over information about their licensing process. And we are still a hot spot for presidential candidates. The trio that visited Las Vegas this week is next on Politics Now. Hello.
Bentley Cadillac. Welcome back to Politics Now. Well, dispensary owners who were denied new marijuana licenses say the state is still stonewalling their requests for information as to why. Earlier this year, the Nevada Department of Taxation issued 61 provisional licenses. Half of those went to just four companies. Those companies, uh, the companies rather, that were denied asked questions about the scoring system that was used and the employees that did the scoring. But their attorney, Ross Miller, says the state is still denying their attempts to get answers. Now he says the state is using a potential marijuana licensing transparency bill, SB 32, to keep stalling. And if there were major flaws in the system, we should, fi we should find out about it so that the legislature could address it. They're delaying so that the legislature will end before we're able to address those problems. And for an industry that's growing like this, still in its infancy, that would be a disaster. There's a million ways that they could turn over information and still protect limited confidential information. This level of secrecy doesn't happen when we issue gaming licenses in the state. It doesn't happen when we issue uh, a license to go sell lemonade on the street corner. SB 32 would make some of that information public, but lawmakers say they never intended for it to be confidential in the first place. I have filed several similar requests with the state about how the program was scored. My requests have been denied as well. Well, the steady stream of presidential candidates visiting Las Vegas continued this week. Democratic contenders, uh, contenders Senator Amy Klobuchar, Bernie Sanders, and South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg, uh, Pete Buttigieg, excuse me, Buttigieg, all here on Monday. Yeah, a lot of people, so it's a little bit of a tongue twister, right? Sanders and Klobuchar spoke at the IAM Transportation Conference. That's the largest airline and rail union conference in North America, and it represents more than 160,000 members. Klobuchar, who is from uh, Minnesota, spoke first. She and Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders highlighted the importance of unions and announced their support to raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. They also talked about health care and lowering the price of some pharmaceuticals. I stand before you today as the granddaughter of a union member, iron ore miner, as the daughter of a union member, newspaper man, and the daughter of a union member, teacher, and the first woman elected to the United States Senate from the state of Minnesota, and a candidate for the President of the United States. We are going to bring the American people together black and white and Latino, gay and straight, native-born and immigrant, no matter what your religion is, we come together. Both also criticized the longest ever federal shutdown, which came under President Donald Trump. And federal uh, fellow presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg paid his first visit to Las Vegas since entering the race. He is currently the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Spoke with voters at a meet and greet at Madhouse Coffee on Desert Inn and Durango. This is a city that is going to look like America is going to look like in 2060, uh, when I'm uh, just a little bit older than the president is today. And so I think we can learn a lot from engaging folks here, and I'm really excited. Well, don't forget 8 News Now is your local election headquarters. For much more on all things election 2020, just go to our website, lasvegasnow.com. Well, Congress has approved the plan to address the shrinking water supply along the Colorado River. The House and Senate both signed off this week. That plan was negotiated by seven states, including Nevada. Mexico will store more water in Lake Mead to make sure it doesn't fall to a level that would spark a federal shortage declaration. Also, it includes drops in usage for Nevada, California, and Arizona. Well, cutting the teeth out of Reed by grade three. When we coddle these kids, say, oh, the poor baby doesn't, you know, you, you know, we'll get you all the way through. How do these kids get a job later on? There are problems with the program, right? We explain the potential change that would keep kids from being held back. And the face-off panel weighs in on if it is or is not a good idea. Plus, a fix for opioid prescription legislation. The changes in one bill that would help long-term pain patients. That's coming up on Politics Now. If you been
Well, Nevada lawmakers moving a bill forward this week that would make major changes to a bill that was passed in 2015 that imposed a fairly strict requirement. All children who could not read by grade level three by the end of the year would have to be held back. It was the read by three idea. It was fairly simple. It came about because experts said third grade was the point at which students should be able to read or their chances to eventually graduate significantly decreased. The bill came with grant money for schools to hire specialists to help teach reading. Assembly Bill 289 would do away with that hold back requirement unless the parents give their written permission to hold the students back. The bill would provide money for more literacy specialists through the fifth grade and develop intensive plans for students to learn to read, involve parents more closely in the process, and give students feedback. The bill's sponsor, back. Assemblyman Tyrone Thompson, said the figures show more than 9,000 students could be held back if the law goes into effect as planned. So basically in our state, um, we will have a second, third grade. So that, that would be the starting point of that um, in our state. Um, I want to reemphasize um, retention causes a traumatic effect on our kids. I want to reemphasize what was stated is that school to prison pipeline is real. All right, put on your thinking. Now remember, not even the Republican lawmakers uh, present asked the bill's supporters what effect not being able to read has on kids as they advance to higher grades. The issues raised in the hearings were also raised four years ago when the bill was passed, but lawmakers in that session believed the accountability portion of the law was important. And while additional funds and staffing for literacy specialists will no doubt help improve students' uh, reading abilities, removing that accountability guts the basic purpose of read by grade. Three. So the big question, should lawmakers get rid of the requirement that kids can be held back if they can't read by three? We asked our face-off panel. Here's KXNT radio host Alan Stock and Battleborn Progress Deputy Director Maria Teresa Lieberman. So when we coddle these kids, say, oh, the poor baby doesn't, you know, you, you know, we'll get you all the way through. How do these kids get a job later on? You go to get a job and somebody says, well, can you do this or can you do that? People say, I have no idea what you're even talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it is hard, but uh, it is, you're doing a favorable thing, tough love, if you'd like to call it that, to a kid in third grade who, who is way behind, you hold them back a year. You do everything you can during the next year to make sure you can bring them up to speed so they can go back and be in the system on a regular basis. But to just go ahead and promote them to the next grade when they do not have the information to go on, they'll be further behind by the end of fourth grade and fifth grade. And some of the ones I mentioned here, by the time they're in eighth grade, only 36% of them are going to be able to read at or above a grade level, 36%. Mm. That is a crime. Putting my tax dollars and your tax dollars into a public education system, that sucks. Hmm. What, do you, what do you think? Should, should that requirement be removed? It is. This is probably one of the most controversial education issues, I think, along with the funding formula that we need to figure out, and hopefully sooner rather than later, because I do agree, we have issues with our literacy rates in our schools, and we need to figure out the root of these issues. So we can't just completely, you know, uh, disregard this or eliminate any kind of repercussions for not being able to read by three, but there are problems with the program, right? There, you know, a kid and a parent, like if I was a parent, I shouldn't go next year, fourth grade, drop off my kid and then be told, no, your kid is held back today. You know, we're not, because the problem is that parents are finding out the day they're dropping off their kids mm. for fourth grade that their kid is not in the fourth grade, the kid is now in the third grade because they got held back. The process needs to be figured out. It shouldn't be an element of surprise months later after your testing. That is much better, absolutely. Okay. I think that, you know, that is the biggest issue with this program for me is that now you're creating this subset of kids that, you know, and parents that thought they were good to go for the fourth grade, they get there and they're actually behind but you know it is a we need to have our kids reading and literate literate it's unfortunate to say that our kids are not literate and we do need to figure that out and um, you know that is, there's just too much with education that we have lagged behind these uh, parents have to be told throughout the year track the kids they're not doing well what do you do you don't just wait till the last day of school or the first day of the next year you start doing what you can during that year to beef up the process that's where the, the, the real problem is in this whole thing. That's one, number one. Number two, 
I, I had talked to uh, Governor Sisolak when he was running as a candidate, and I said to him, to me, one of the most important issues in education uh, is, is really is not teacher funding. Throw, give each teacher $100,000 more. It's not going to change the education system a whit. It's not the size of classes, because I went to classes that had 45 kids in it, and we all graduated. What it boils down to, to me, a lot of it uh, are the, the parents not getting involved. Well, with a busy week in the state capitol, this Eye on Carson City will focus on some other bills that are moving forward this week. A bill that would double the money for Zoom schools moved forward Friday. The Zoom program was started by the legislature in 2013. It targets the lowest performing schools with the highest percentage of English language learners. Those schools get extra intensive services specifically to help those students. The bill takes the funding from, for those programs from $50 million up to $100 million. Another bill would allow consumers to prevent a website operator from selling your information to people. A bill would allow consumers, the bill rather, to uh, request that to happen through an email or online form. Other states have recently passed similar laws. And a bill in the assembly aims to fix some of the problems with an opioid prescription crackdown bill that came out of the 2017 session. Long-term pain patients that suffer from acute pain have been criticizing the bill for cutting them off of the medication they use. AB 239 would allow extended opioid prescriptions for patients when the doctor deems medically necessary. Now, many doctors say they won't even take on pain patients because of the quotas of opioid prescriptions that have been set by the state. Well, creating the first state element, how Nevada passed what's the most important bill in the history of the United States, maybe even the world. That's next. Victim. Watching Politics Now. Well, every week we bring you stories in Politics Now from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Now you can read all of their stories by going to LasVegasNow.com. So here is a look at what they are working on this week. Robocalls. We all get them and we hate them. Now lawmakers are working on legislation to make it stop. You can get the 411 on the Washington, D.C. section of our website right now. All right, so you can just go to our website to read all of their stories, lasvegasnow.com, and click on the Washington News section. Well, back here in Nevada, the third bill to be passed and signed by the governor this session makes NEON the official state element of Nevada. AB 162 now passed the Senate 
went unanimously this week and uh, later signed by Governor Sisolak that night. Lawmakers said it makes Nevada the first state to actually have an official state element. That legislation was brought on from uh, students up in Carson City getting together and saying, hey, I think this would be a good idea. Well, as always, we thank you so much for watching Politics Now. Steve will be back next week to join me. You can email me at pwalker at lasvegasnow.com. Stay up to date online and watch us right here every Saturday. Have a good one.